be here with you this morning for the 2021 Transitions Academy Fall Convening. I want to welcome you all this morning and I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce Jennifer Foster. Jennifer is the Deputy Executive Director for the Illinois Community College Board. She has worked with adult education in the state of Illinois for over 21 years. And many of you might not know that Jennifer is the one who conceptualized the Transitions Academy. So as we moved into the work with um, the IETs, we moved into the work with the ICAPS programming. Jennifer was the individual who said, I have this vision for bringing together these individuals and supporting them with professional development and technical assistance. So we are all here today um, to really execute her vision. Uh, Jennifer has been with ICCB for more than 21 years and worked in adult education for nearly 30 years. She has been the past chair of the National Adult Education Professional Development Consortia and the National Council of State Directors of Adult Education. She's also a member of the State Workforce Board and the Chicago Workforce Board. Ms. Foster has been instrumental in the development of adult education strategic plan, creating pathways for adult learners. And she's also been instrumental in many other strategic plans along the way. And it's just my pleasure to introduce to you our Deputy Executive Director, Jennifer Foster. Thank you and good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Amy, and thank you so much. Um, and I'm so pleased to be here with you. Uh, we were uh, hammering around this morning trying to determine which, uh, what, when did we start the Transitions Academy? And we think, think it was sometime uh, around 2013, 2014, where we brought together our first uh, five and then moved on to eight and then moved on to 12 um, uh, individual uh, institutions to talk about uh, transitions and career pathways. Uh, back in the day, I always say back in the day, the uh, career pathways were just sort of making their way on the on the scene, where we were working with the Gates Foundation, the Kellogg Foundation, and Jobs for the Future as a part of accelerating opportunity. And so it is just uh, wonderful to see how. Um, the Transition Academy has uh, progressed over the years, and I am uh, very happy. While I don't have a lot of direct things going on right now in terms of oversight, I uh, am getting constant updates uh, from, from staff as it relates to um, how we're progressing with our career pathway initiatives, our integrated education and training, as well as um, bridge programs. So I um, appreciate all of the work that you have put into this and the work that you will continue uh, in, in the future. I just wanted to come on and give you a, a few updates as to what's going on in, in, in the state and wanted to um, give you just some insights into sort of the future of career pathways. In uh, the past few years, we've come up with a career pathway definition guidebook that provides lots of different definitions related to career pathways, integrated education and training, apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship. So we are progressing. And we try to make certain that as we're developing or working with entities that are developing um, different uh, definitions, that we make certain that we're building upon what we have done in the past. And if any of you know me, uh, you know that I am a big, um, uh, uh, a big uh, pusher of trying to make, don't forget, Uh, what we've done in the past and that we can build upon that and making certain discussions because ultimately what we want to do is help our, our students, help our students to be, um, um, to obtain family sustaining wages. I think that is so, so important We that we definitely look at making certain that they have all of the skills that are necessary 
for them to uh, get the jobs, uh, not only of the future, but uh, today. And if you have spent any amount of time looking at the news, then you know a lot of jobs that are available right now, whether uh, it's in our hospitality industry, restaurant industry, supply chain, uh, management, um, any of our, um, our manufacturing, uh, transportation, distribution, and logistics. If you're looking at, at the news, then you know there is a huge need for us to accelerate the time to completion for our students. And that includes both our career and adult education students. We need to make certain that we're combining, we're doing some integrated education and training and some bridge programming so that individuals come out of this, not only with their, um, their um, high school equivalency, but also that they're coming out with some short-term certificates, um, uh, advanced certificates, basic certificates, industry recognized credentials, as well as an associate's degree. We wanna make certain that we are making sure that our folks are um, really pushing uh, in this area and trying to get them into that family sustaining wage. So one of the things that I wanted to talk with you about this morning is the Illinois Community College Board uh, a few weeks ago just released its economic impact study. And it talks about the need and the value of not only our community colleges, but those that help to feed into our community colleges, our school districts, our regional offices of education and our community-based organization and wanting to make certain that we are taking a look at student level outcomes and what those return on investments actually take. Uh, we are boosting our economy, uh, especially our, at our local level and within our communities. It's important uh, that we have great sources of revenue, that we are looking at employment for our different communities, making certain that we are looking for, to add additional jobs. And as I was looking through the fact sheet that is located on our ICCB website, the colleges on the statewide economy in fiscal year 2020 is estimated at $3.5 billion and 43,316 jobs. We are, we are um, working with 9,800 unique employers around the state. So our employers need us. Our employers need us to help with the training, um, not only of, of, of our individuals without employment. So we need to make certain that as we're moving forward and we're discussing um, the economic impact, that we're making certain that we're training our individuals for those short-term certificates and that we are getting them prepared for information uh, technology jobs, uh, jobs. We are also preparing them for transportation jobs. We have um, also you know, the HVAC and refrigeration, we're uh, making certain that, the, that there is a, we know that there, there is a huge, um, a huge teacher pipeline. We want to build up on that as, as well. So lots of job opportunities for us. We're working uh, with our local workforce or our statewide workforce board in defining apprenticeship. We have staff, and uh, I know that some of you may be part of that way uh, to get individuals into the earn and learn models, making certain that they can obtain the skills while in training programs that we that we have. So so important that we're looking at apprenticeships as well.
Also defining what pre-apprenticeships are. And in adult education and CTE, we have already defined what that looks like by um, working uh, to expand our, our uh, integrated education and training programs, as well as our bridge program programs, including pre-bridge, uh, as well as our, our overall bridge programs. Uh, so we're, we're moving forward. We have such programs. We know that our community colleges are moving forward as it relates to uh, apprenticeship programs and trying to expand those. We're looking at our CAPIT model, um, and we're, we're trying to make certain that we are moving folks forward. We are serving uh, between um, 45 and 50,000 individuals in adult basic education uh, annually, and we want to continue that. But not only continue, we want to, to provide those individuals with career pathways. We want to strengthen that that we are moving individuals in the direction uh, that they need to, and also providing the support that is necessary. So we appreciate your partnerships that you're, you're collaborating with your local workforce boards. We appreciate your, your partnerships with your local employers as you build your model uh, is going to fulfill a lot of the information that you're going to need in order to do that acceleration as well as that expansion. Uh, we want you to take advantage of the differing um, sessions that will be offered. Um, we also want you to pay particular attention. Uh, a huge uh, thing that's happening is our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we want to make certain that as you're looking looking at who you're serving in your programs uh, and also in your programs of study, that you are concentrated on fulfilling gaps and what those gaps, what gaps exist within your own local institutions and making certain that we're attracting, that we're doing whatever we can to, to um, bring those populations uh, into the fold of transitions and career pathways. So uh, as you're moving of uh, the ICCB staff uh, for all of your work in this area of transitions, and also thank you to ICSPS and also SIPDC and any other partners that are which is transitions and building career pathways. Definitely thank you um, for all of your hard work. I know that this is intense work and thank you so much uh, for making certain that we are building those career pathways, those bridge programs, those integrated um, education and training models that will help our students obtain the skills, and also realize the economic opportunity that they will have uh, by participating in these programs. Thank you again and enjoy the Transitions Academy. I am so excited uh, that we are moving into uh, new areas and new arenas of your day. And I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We so appreciate you um, joining us today, welcoming everyone, laying out the vision. And I just wanna uh, piggyback on what Amy said. We appreciate that you had this vision for the Transitions Academy all those years ago. Um, so appreciate that. And I just wanna point out one of, part of Jennifer's vision for the Transitions Academy, I remember she said, it's not gonna be one and done. So we have the Transitions Academy, November 2nd and 3rd, today and tomorrow but there are many, many other opportunities to support you um, moving forward in the next months to come through next June. So Kirsten put in the um, uh, chat, the link to take you back to the agenda. There's also a resource page there for the Transitions Academy. So I so appreciate that. I wanna say a couple of thank yous, but then we're gonna move into our next session. So Cece uh, and Janelle, if you want to go ahead and share, that's great. 
And while I'll introduce you in just a second, I do wanna say thank you to ICCB for all their support. Um, they, you'll see them on the agenda quite a bit, this robust agenda that we have for you. Um, also, I wanna say thank you to the ICSPS team and the SIPDC team. Uh, there's a been a lot of work that's been done to put this all together for you. So we thank all of, all of the individuals. This is the point where we would all stand up and like clap for Jennifer and clap for all the people at ICCB, SI, ICSPS and SIPDC. So feel free if you've been sitting for a while to stand up and clap. Uh, but without further ado, let's go ahead and turn it over to our next presentation. And we have uh, Cecilia El Haddad and Janelle Jones. Cece is our Director for Adult Education and Literacy and Janelle is our Director for Career and Technical Education. So we so appreciate them uh, teaming up today and getting us started talking about data to improve performance. All right, thank you, Sarah, so much for that introduction. As she mentioned, uh, Janelle and I will be presenting today um, just doing a brief overview on how data are used to improve performance in our state. And if you'll just give us a second, we are going to um, go ahead and fix the, uh, <laughs> the background issue that we have going on. Uh, if you'll just excuse us for one second. You'll probably have to remove it, Janelle and CC, because it won't allow for more than one person in the picture. There should be an option for none, or if you could click the little X. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Okay, so our presentation is going to be broken into three general categories. The first question we'll be answering is, how are data used in adult education and career and technical education? Then we will transition into how those data are stored. And we will wrap up by sharing some resources that you can use if you'd like to continue exploring data in these two fields. So we'll start off with how data are used in adult education. So one way that they're used are to set and adjust expectations about performance. So um, one example, of, or a couple of examples of these are with generation and state performance targets. So in adult education, we assign a monetary value to enrollment hours to monitor the use of grant funds. And in spring earlier this year, a statewide report on the current status of these data was used to determine that an existing rule in adult education should be waived in light of challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. We also use data um, by presenting them during meetings in order to negotiate our performance targets as a state. So one example of those performance targets is the 44.7% measurable skill gains rate target. Another way we use fund, um, data is to calculate funding allocations. We combine a series of enrollment and performance data in order to decide how much uh, both state and federal funding each program in our state should get. We also use data in order to determine which programs should be placed on or taken off of probation and watch lists. And we also use data in order to set the threshold for those um, probation and watch lists. And one final use is to evaluate gaps and to improve equity in our state. So last year, um, as part of the Advisory Council on Equity, I created a report using enrollment data from the last 10 fiscal years. And, was, and I was able to address how the demographics of our student population have shifted over, the, over those 10 years. And the, this report was used to develop a plan in order to improve equity across the state. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Janelle and she's gonna talk about how data are used in career and technical education. Oh, but before that, 
um, I also wanted to share um, just a simple graph on how our enrollment um, NRS reportable participant count has changed over the past fiscal years. So using these data, we were able to um, develop a performance plan in order to help programs improve their enrollment um, during the spring of last fiscal year as well. And now it's all, all you right. know. Thanks, Cece. Um, so I'm going to talk about how data are used in um, CTE. Um, and I'll preface this by stating that most of our work in CTE is guided by the Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act, um, which we call Perkins 5 or Perkins for short. And Perkins is the primary law and source of funding for CTE. Um, for CTE. Um, so the data that I'm gonna be talking about is um, primarily in regards to Perkins. So one way that we use data is to determine funding allocations just like an adult did. Um, an example in CTE though is that we use the number of CTE enrollees and CTE completers um, receiving the Pell Grant to determine the amount um, of Perkins funds that the colleges will receive each year. Um, another way that we use data is to evaluate programmatic risk. So ICCB is required to conduct programmatic monitoring annually um, to review compl compliance with the Perkins Law, um, the grantee compliance. And so we use data to conduct an annual risk assessment to determine um, the grantee's risk level. Um, and that indicates how the colleges will be monitored. Um, so if grantees are low risk, they'll receive a fiscal and programmatic programmatic technical assistance. Um, if they're moderate risk, they receive a desk review um, by ICCB staff. And then if they're elevated or at an, an elevated risk, then they receive an on-site um, review um, just to um, review their programmatic activities. We also use data for accountability and continuous improvement. So accountability and continuous improvement is one of Illinois' six guiding principles. Um, developed <clears throat> to organize the goals that are listed in Perkins 5. So each year, colleges have to conduct a performance data analysis. And to do so, um, colleges look at disaggregated data by gender, race, ethnicity, and special populations as defined by Perkins um, for three performance in indicators. And those include post-secondary retention and placement, earned recognized post-secondary credential, and non-traditional program enrollment. So the college does this for each CTE program. ICCB maintains this data for the colleges um, for, um, for convenient access. And I'm gonna discuss the system later that we use to house this data. So if um, we have on our screen, on the slide, there's the state level determined the state determined level um, of performance. And so when the colleges conduct their data analysis, if they fall below the state um, determined level of performance in any of these indicators, then they have to complete a performance um, improvement plan. And they have to develop improvement activities that target low performance CTE student populations in order to improve um, the performance in the deficient areas. And we also use data to improve access and equity. Um, again, access, equity, and opportunity is another one of Illinois' guiding principles. So colleges receiving Perkins funds are required to conduct a comprehensive local needs assessment or CLNA every two years in collaboration with a robust number of internal and external stakeholders. This is a data-informed continuous improvement process in which colleges determine how their CTE programs and programs of study are aligned with local workforce and economic needs in six different areas, which include student performance data, size, scope, and quality of CTE programs, labor, mar labor market alignment, progress towards implementing CTE programs of study, recruitment, retention, and training of faculty and staff, and then progress towards improving access and equity. So the CLNA requires colleges to disaggregate data um, again to identify, analyze, and work towards closing equity gaps for underserved um, student populations. And finally, um, data is used in CTE to inform programs of study. 
And this is um, colleges will use labor market data to, to determine which programs to study to prioritize, um, as well as what revisions may be necessary for programs to study. Um, for example, if a college determines that the local area is in need of manufacturing um, workers, then manufacturing will become the program of, um, program of study focus for the year. And the college might work to you know, improve industry standard equipment, um, maybe work towards marketing and recruiting of students for that, for that area. So that's one other way that data is used in career and technical education. Great. So next we're going to transition into a discussion of how um, data are stored in both adult education and career and technical education. So we'll start with adult ed. So for any of you listening in from an adult education program, you're probably familiar with DAISY, which stands for Data and Information System Illinois. That is our main database that houses all um, all enrollment, attendance, and level gain data for adult education students in our state. We also use the high school equivalency database in order to store all high school equivalency exam data. So every month we conduct a data match between DAISY and the HSC database in order to identify students who have either taken or passed a high school equivalency exam. And this helps us determine which students are eligible to earn measurable skill gain type two. We also use um, the Illinois Department of Employ Employment Security Database to conduct um, a yearly study of which students um, gained employment after exiting from an adult education program. So at the end of every fiscal year, IDES sends a file with employment information and we match this information with data from DAISY in order to obtain that information. Finally, we use the National Student Clearinghouse, which is a database that contains data on post-secondary enrollment. And again, every year, we conduct a, a data match to identify students who've passed a post-secondary course or who've obtained post-secondary credentials after exiting from adult education programs. So all of these databases kind of work together in order to help us determine how our programs are doing in terms of the NRS um, post-exit indicators. And the reason that I wanted to talk about all of these different databases today is to highlight the importance of getting our data right. Even one misspelling or one misentry of a social security number can cause a data match that occurs between these two databases to fail. And that means that we have the potential for measurable skill gains or for our enrollment um, or for our performance indicators to be misleading. So it's very important that as we're entering data into these databases um, and on the high school equivalency exams that we're getting it right. And now I'll turn it over to Janelle. Okay, so for CTE, one of the big um, data storage um, systems that we use is PODS, which and is now called PODS 2.0. So PODS is the post-secondary online data system. And I listed both because um, PODS, the original PODS is a series of Excel sheets that colleges are able to access. Um, and PODS 2 is a newer website that's more user-friendly. So PODS is maintained by ICCB and it houses institutional trend data for each college for the performance indicators that I discussed previously. Um, so to collect this data from the college, from each college, ICCB uses student level data from the annual student enrollment and completion submission or the A1 submission um, you probably are maybe familiar with. Um, and so again, the original pods is a series of um, Excel documents and I listed that because if um, anyone's looking for historical data, um, it's definitely a, a great resource. Um, but then again, pods two is the new database. 
um, that's more convenient and easy to navigate. Um, it's in a beta release right now. Um, and so, but before our, we had some technical difficulties here at the ICCB uh, with IT. And so we are not able to access it um, for full use, but prior to our, um, our data trouble or our IT trouble, our um, colleges were able to access this um, pods to in preparation for their um, Perkins application for fiscal year 2022. So they did have, they did have access to this dashboard, um, but it's not as functional um, as before, just <clears throat> as we work to rebuild. So in order to use, um, Colleges will use POS to identify their most um, recent year's outcomes for each of the performance indicators that we talked about earlier, and they'll com compare that to the state to determine level of performance. Um, POS allows colleges to see data by race, ethnicity, gender, and special populations um, as they're required to disaggregate um, data in that manner. And they're able to determine which subgroups are positively or negatively impacting their overall performance. Um, and also we use data books. So we have data books available that store um, different um, data points. Um, so ICCB produces these comprehensive data books which provide summaries um, of data by community colleges. These data books include information on fall student characteristics, um, faculty and staff data, annual enrollment and completion data, and financial data. And then lastly, the Illinois post-secondary profiles so that's a public site, um, and we'll have we have it linked in this one of our last slides. But it's a collaborative effort between ICCB, um, the Illinois Board of Higher Education, the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, and Northern Illinois University. Um, it includes three major pathways to explore post-secondary data, and these include institutional profiles. And so within the institutional pro profiles. Um, users can explore data at any public or private post-secondary institution in Illinois. Um, it also stores occupations um, profiles, and that allows users to explore data based on occupational interest um, or academic program. And then finally, it includes an equity profile, um, which is coming soon. But that pathway, um, it'll be released soon, and it allows users to explore data through various demographics. All right, um, so we are now in the final leg of our presentation and we're gonna talk about some resources that you can explore if you're interested in learning um, or just browsing through some data in both adult education and career and technical education. So the first resource that we wanted to mention is the National Reporting System for Adult Education. Here you can find the NRS outcomes for every year um, since the fiscal year between 2000 and 2001. So if you're interested in finding out how enrollment or measurable skill gains trends have changed in Illinois and other states across fiscal years, this would be a great resource to check out. The second resource I wanted to mention are the index of need tables. Um, these show demographic trends by APC. And unfortunately for adult education, um, APC 428, which contains data on corrections facilities is not included, um, but otherwise every APC is represented by the index of need tables. So if you're interested in finding out how the demographics of your APC have changed over years, um, this would be a great thing to take a look at. And finally, we have the college to career tool, which contains data related to educational attainment and earnings, as well as college advancement rate, college retention, college costs, student debt, earnings in Illinois, earnings growth in Illinois, and a host of other factors. So this would be a great thing to take a look at in order to, um, as Janelle was mentioning before, kind of shape your programs in order to set your students up for success. Great. And then these are just some resources uh, for CTE data. Um, we have the annual reports. Um, compiled by ICCB that you can take a look at, um, the data books, a success, student success metric, um, and then again, the Illinois post-secondary profiles site. All right. 
And that concludes our presentation. And it looks like we have a little bit of time for questions, if you have any. And Sarah, let us know how much uh, time we have until the next presentation starts. Yeah, uh, Janelle and Cece, thank you very much. And we do have time for questions uh, because we're running ahead. Awesome. Yeah, so please put those in the chat. And this is your opportunity where you've got these two directors sitting here and you can ask them tons of questions. All right, um, I see one person asked, um, how are students, oh, never mind. So um, someone brought up just the issue of students without social security numbers. And um, so students without social security numbers are reported on, but um, because social security numbers are used to um, create a match with the employment database and the National Student Clearinghouse database, um, those data matches might not be successful for students without government issued social security numbers. Um, so you can still report on measurable skill gains as far as um, level gains go and as far as high school equivalency data go, but um, the other post exit indicators might be a little more tricky. Yeah, so as far as the um, data interruption, um, earlier in the summer, there was um, construction around our building that um, caused our service to go down. Um, and then in with this, when the service went down, we just lost access to some of our some of our data and our, our IT has worked to rebuild um, to um, rebuild and restore our website and things like that. If you notice probably all of our whole our website was out for a little while, that was because of the server interruption. but they they worked to rebuild that and uh, just restore access to our data. Great, and then I see someone asked about um, the equity assessment and um, sort of plan that we developed last year using the um, data that I kind of pulled together for the Advisory Council on Equity. And one major thing that we found is that we really just need more data um, because the data that we were looking at as far as APCs go, because they didn't, uh, tease out the data that was specific to APC 428. Um, I couldn't really compare apples to apples as far as enrollment um, and um, adult education eligible students in each APC. So what I really wanted to do was to see which people in each APC are eligible for adult education and compare that to the enrollment in adult education programs in each APC. And what we found is we really didn't have the data necessary for that kind of analysis. So we're working with um, the folks that calculate our index of need tables in order to try to collect that data so we can do some more sophisticated analysis. Um, and the next question is, how can we access the adult education performance charts that I mentioned earlier? Um, so I'm actually going to switch over to a browser now. And so this is what the National Reporting System website looks like. This is a public site and it's linked in the presentation, um, which you will get sent out later. And it contains um, I believe I've linked it straight to Illinois, so you can find all of our data going back to um, fiscal year 2001. Um, and you can kind of just browse through, um, for example, this is the last published data that are available, and it's for fiscal year 20. And um, it has all of the tables in the NRS performance report, as well as um, the state performance report, which tells a little bit about um, post-secondary and employment performance in adult education programs. And in regards, right, um, any other questions? Um, just we can answer. Talk about how to access the, um, in regards to Daisy, one frustration is that we cannot continue to enter 
um, contact folks on students if they are not enrolled during the next fiscal year. So one thing that you could do if you have a student that you're kind of keeping tabs on, um, even if they're not enrolled in the current fiscal year, you're welcome to copy their record over to the current fiscal year and then um, just create a custom field and then um, just for, I don't know, like a contact notes. And then every time you try to contact that student, just jot down um, how it goes in, their, in that custom field. And then um, it'll kind of help you keep tabs on them and um, maybe help you get in touch with them further along. And thank you so much, Kirsten, for linking our presentation. So if you're interested in checking out some of the websites that we linked in the presentation now, you're welcome to do so. There's also another question that I don't think you're seeing because it's in a different format, but is um, Pentaho in the process of being updated? Can you give a little um, update on that? Yes. Um, so Pentaho is a... Um, it's a tool that is linked to the information in DAISY, and it is the, uh, I guess it's like a software program that helps us develop the reports that we have available to adult education programs. And it is, it is currently undergoing an update so that you'll be able to do some more sophisticated um, kind of data wrangling in the ad hoc tool. So we are looking to add a tool that allows you to create pivot tables directly in the Pentaho interface itself. So you won't have to download the data and then clean it all up and then create your pivot tables as you do right now. Um, it'll allow you to report on um, any measure that you'd like in any format that you'd like. So once that is released, then I will do a little training myself and then I will conduct a training for the field so that that is a tool that you have up to, at your disposal. And I think we have just about one minute left. Is that correct, Sarah? Yeah, there's one more question. Could you just talk a little bit about how DAISY connects to post-secondary reporting? And that's yeah, the last so, question I see. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we have the data from the National Student Clearinghouse, which contains uh, data on students that are enrolled in post-secondary courses. So at the end of every fiscal year, we take sort of a list of all students that have been enrolled in adult education programs, and we get that from DAISY. And then we take a list of all the students that were enrolled in post-secondary courses from the National Student Clearinghouse, and we match those against each other to figure out which students were enrolled in both. And that helps us get a sense of um, maybe if a student exited from an adult education program during the fall, were they enrolled in a post-secondary course during the spring? And that helps us calculate our success on the NRS performance indicators. All right, thank you very much um, to both of you. I don't see any other questions. I will mention that this presentation as well as all the presentations are being recorded and will be available for people to uh, view later if you want to review any of this information. Um, seeing some thanks there in the chat. So another round of applause for Janelle and for Cece. And um, Cece, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen before we leave this session. Whoops. Looks like somebody needs to give me permission. I, I, have, I don't have the power. I'd like to have the power, but I do not have the power yet. So um, what I was going to show you because I'm a visual person and because I didn't want my face to be big on the screen is the agenda that's coming up. Um, so we have a little break now, and then we'll be back here at, uh, well, we'll be back on online at 11. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah, thanks. At 11 o'clock, we have the um, uh, breakout sessions. There's three of them. Connecting students to partnerships using whatever it takes, ideas that work. Thank you for um, Valerie from Wabanzi Community College. Academic IET, the Washington State model and then tidying up your bridges from Angela Gerberding. So those are all of the presentations that are coming up 
at 11 o'clock. The um, Zoom links are all embedded in the agenda on the site that Kirsten has posted a couple of times. So that's there for you as well. And um, as I mentioned, everything will be recorded and available. And so at this point, I just want to add one, a couple things. Don't forget to join us for lunch. So we do have food with friends. So you can choose a breakout and just pop in there and have lunch. Um, we have the IELC innovations, staff burnout. How do we handle staff fatigue? And then binge worthy shows. So if you're really, if you're loaded and you're like, I've got enough content for this morning, I need to just talk about Netflix. That's your breakout for lunch. And then this afternoon, when we come back together again, we'll be looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion for ICAPS and Bridge, spotlighting those equity videos that Jennifer alluded to, a lot of the work that we're doing around DEI. And then in addition to that, we'll all be together from one through two, and it's two 30-minute rapid sessions. Um, ability to benefit updates are there as well. And then we go back into breakouts for this afternoon, 2.15 to 3.15, and then come back at the end for a close. Um, just wanted to make sure that you knew your lunch options because there is a lot of fun things that we have planned for you and we want you to be able to participate in all of those. Everything is accessible through that link that Kirsten's been sharing in the um, chat there. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. Sorry, Sarah, didn't mean to interrupt. Just want to okay. make sure we highlighted lunch because that's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I'm just going to dovetail on Amy and say that lunch, just so you know, there's not going to be any conference chicken delivered to your door. So if you're waiting, it's not coming unless you order it and have it delivered. Uh, but we would love to see you and have those conversations as you eat your lunch. So again, thank you all for joining us this morning. We look forward to seeing you in the breakout sessions at 11. Thank you.